it's terrific to be here and to be emceeing this event. Uh, just so you know, for those who have maybe never attended a, a, a Gilder Fellows seminar, I mean, really what you're going to get is you're going to get a kind of a mix of interpretation of George Gilder's work over the years, an extension and development of it from people like Gail Pooley, who are really developing what I would say is a kind of Gilder-esque understanding of the economy and the human person. And then people and uh, speakers that have been influenced by George's work over the years, including me, but uh, Gail and, and virtually everyone else speaking. It's been my pleasure to be a, a colleague of George's since 1998 when I started at the Discovery Institute full time. Uh, and his thought finds its way into a lot of my own work. And so I'll be speaking later this morning. But first up is Gail Pooley. And so for those of you who don't know Gail, let me just introduce him. He is a senior fellow at the Center on Wealth, Poverty, and morality here at the Discovery Institute. He's also an associate professor of business management at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, which it sounds like about as good a gig as, as it is. Uh, he's taught economics and business at uh, Al Faisal University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Brigham Young University, Idaho, Boise State University, and the College of Idaho. He also serves on the board of humanprogress.org, a, pro a project of the Cato Institute. And this morning, um, Gail is going to lead us off with an introduction to George Gilder's information theory of economics. Gail, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, my name, uh, once again, is Gail. And um, I. Uh, we have some things that we've discovered uh, with George's writing and his work that we want to be able to share with you today. And we think that you're going to find it very valuable. What I'd like to do is share my screen here. Uh, got a little uh, uh, PowerPoint that I'm going to share. Everybody seen that okay? All right, very good. So uh, first of all, my colleague that uh, I do uh, most of my research with is Dr. Mary Atupi. He's at Cato. So I want to recognize him, first of all. Um, what we're going to try to do is introduce you to this information theory of economics that George has developed. And it really uh, is based on three fundamental principles. So let me uh, begin by asking you the first question, what is wealth? Before you answer that, I uh, wanna give you a little quiz. Remember, I'm, I'm a professor, so I love, I love giving quizzes. So here's our first quiz. <clears throat> How many keys are on a piano? Um, Somebody says 88, I think that's the correct answer. So second question is, how many songs are in a piano? Yeah, that's the question that we really wanna think about is the number of songs in a piano, okay? All right, so anybody know this guy? Remember in Infinity Wars, Thanos, he makes this statement. He says, it's simple calculus. The universe is finite, its resources finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. Now, <clears throat> one of our objectives here is that we hope that you can stop thinking like Thanos and think more like uh, George Gilder because of when Thanos looks at a piano, he sees 88 keys and he goes, you've got 88 keys. You must only have 88 songs there, right? So in a sense, he's correct that there is a fixed number of atoms on the planet, but it's what we do with these atoms and our creativity that we really uh, begin to discover how we can create value for one another. So the first principle that we want to think about, or the first idea that we want to think about is that economics is not physics. Economics is about knowledge, not atoms. Atoms are important, but economics really focuses in on knowledge. And knowledge is not subject to the laws of physics. So we want to give you a few examples to illustrate why this is the case. Okay, $2 million beautiful sports car. MIT professor, former MIT professor Cesar Hildago talked about this. He said, we've got this car, uh, it's worth $2 million. This is the car after uh, a modification. <laughs> so what is the difference between these two cars? I mean, these two, two pictures of the same car. Well, the atoms are the same, right? We've got the same atoms. It's the value that counts. The value suddenly evaporated, disappeared because those atoms got rearranged. So when we think about resources, we never really run out of resources. 
What we use resources for is to create things of greater value, things that are more valuable. Think about your iPhone for a second. Think about your smartphone. It's about six ounces, weighs about six ounces. You've got almost 70 different elements that were used to create this device. Now, if you were to melt this thing down, crush it, melt it down, those elements would be worth just, just a few pennies maybe, not worth much at all. But our ability to organize these things and then add intelligence to them, we're really intelligizing atoms. And that's what creates the value, the knowledge that we add. Now, what I, uh, what I would love to do is I'd love to find the art supply store where uh, Da Vinci went and bought this canvas and the paints. If I could only find that art supply store <laughs> and buy the same type of canvas and the same paints, uh, I could do this, right? Yeah, wrong. It, it's not the, the paint and it's not the canvas that counts. It's the way that Da Vinci was able to put these things together that creates the value. So <clears throat> Thomas Sowell, uh, uh, hopefully you, you've heard about him. If you, if you haven't, we encourage you to read his works. Um, he, he talks about this idea and he says, um, the caveman had the same natural resources at their disposal as we have today. The difference, difference between their standard of living and ours is the difference between the knowledge they could bring to bear on those resources and the knowledge we use today. So could they make an iPhone? Uh, back in the Stone Age? Well, they had all the, the same atoms that we have today. What were they missing? Well, they didn't have the knowledge. How do we get the knowledge? We gotta have this process that we call innovation. And George says, the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely due to this growth and accumulation of knowledge. So economics is really about this, how we study it's the study of how human beings create value for one or how do you create value for another person and how do they do that for you? It's this value creation process that we're studying. Now, value is this function of how we create and organize things. Now, we, we can organize atoms in different ways, but we can also organize and create all kinds of different things. Musical notes, words on a page, pictures on a screen, bits and software, all of these are acts of creative uh, imagination that's, that's done by human beings. Now, we also recognize that value, the value that we assign to things can change as fast as people can change their minds, all right? So what is wealth? Wealth is knowledge. That's our first principle. Let's think about this a little bit. If I have a Snickers bar and I decide to share it with you, we each get a half of a Snickers bar, right? But if I have an idea, a piece of knowledge, and I share it with you, for example, if I have a candle and I light your candle, we now have twice as much, uh, we have twice as much candle in the room, right? So what we can think about is, is when we think about atoms, we share these atoms, I get half and you get half. But when I share my knowledge with someone, when you share your knowledge with me, we can double the amount of knowledge in a room. So knowledge is really the thing that we, we want to think about. What is wealth? It's really knowledge, okay? So how do we grow knowledge? What is growth? That's our second question. All right, anybody know where this is? Do we have anybody from uh, this part of the world? Okay, when I, when I first saw this picture, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was the, uh, one of the islands in Hawaii and that, and that was volcanoes going off. But it, it's actually a view at night of the Korean Peninsula. There's North Korea and South Korea. Now, what do you think the light is telling you? The light is telling you how free people are to learn. How free people are to learn. Now, at the end of the Korean War, it used to be just one country. At the end of the Korean War, the little dividing line there, you can see that little, little line there. Uh, people in the North were richer than people in South Korea. Today, South Koreans are 20 times richer than their cousins in the North. And why is that? Well, the South Koreans are free to learn. And we see that with the light that they now have that allows them to do that. Now, the other uh, idea that we want to talk about is this idea of learning curves. And what a learning curve is, is it's, it, it describes this characteristic 
that when we double output, our cost per unit fall between 20 and 30%. So the, every time I double output, I learn things that allow me to lower cost. And we see this all over the place. We see it, uh, we see it in, in computer chips. And the reason they become so inexpensive is because we've made so many of them. We make so many of them that we've learned how to make them less using less and less resources. So learning curves. Every time you double output, you reduce cost by 20 to 30 percent. And we see it all over the place. So a key to growth is getting on learning curves. Poultry eggs, trucking miles, lines yeah. of software code. Yeah, all this uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's all. It's amazing. Learning curves are ubiquitous. They're, they're all over the place. Yeah. So um, now Albert Hirschman talked about this. He, 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 he talks about when we learn, we're really uh, discovering surprises. We're discovering things that we didn't already know. That's really what information is. Is it something we don't already know? It's something that changes our mind, a surprise to us. We think about creativity and surprises. They're kind of the same thing, right? Creativity always comes as a surprise. Now, ready for quiz two. How many seeds are in an apple? Well, we can open an apple up and we can count the seeds, right? It's pretty straightforward. So how many apples are in a seed? We really don't know how many apples in there are in a seed. We know that seeds are this, they are a perpetual growth machine, right? <laughs> they, can, they can grow new apples. Okay, anybody know who these two guys are? Well, they're the two Steves. The guy on the left is Steve Wozniak. The guy on the right is Steve Jobs. These two guys got together in the early 1970s and they developed Apple Computer. Notice that Steve Wozniak, he's this inventor guy. Look at what he's focusing on. <clears throat> he's looking at, at what he's been able to create. Steve Jobs, on the other hand, what is he doing? He's looking at you and I thinking about it cannot it is what my friend has created here. Does it create value that you also value? Okay. When these two seeds got together, there was some real magic that happened. This, this great magic that happened, in fact. Now, Steve Jobs, an interesting guy. His father was actually from Syria. He was a, his biological father was from Syria. So he was adopted at a very young age. And he was adopted by a family in uh, what we call Silicon Valley in, in California. And so he was fortunate that he was able to be able to be planted in a place where he could flourish, where there was water and there was sunlight and there were other seeds around that he was able to flourish and, and manifest his ideas for, for all of us. Imagine what his life had been like if he had been born in Syria. So here's a question for you. How many Steve Jobs are in Syria today? Or how many of these Steve Jobs are all over the planet? We don't know where they are. We know they're there though. We know that they're there and they have this potential to bloom and manifest, okay? So we can count the number of babies that are born today. We can go and count how many babies are born today. But what we can't count is the number of ideas that they potentially create. These are surprises. These are surprises. Now, when an idea is created, where do we determine whether or not that's a valuable idea? Markets are where this is tested. This is where our learning gets tested because when we go to the market, everybody gets to vote on what, we th what they think the value is of our new idea or our invention. Now, an idea that becomes an invention and then becomes an innovation, innovations are these market successful inventions, okay? It's where we take our inventions to go get tested and those that are successful, we call those innovations. So question two, what is growth? Growth is learning, growth is learning, okay? All right, so now we wanna talk about money, okay? What is money? Now there's uh, lots of definitions about money. Uh, before you answer that question, though, here's, here's what I want you to think about. When you go to the store 
to buy a loaf of bread, what is more important to you? The number of loaves on the shelf or the price? What's more important to you? I think you've, you'll say that the price is more important. Have you ever gone to the store and counted the number of loaves on the shelf? Or is it the price? The price, we say, the price is more valuable information than the quantity. So we move from quantity to price. This is the mistake that Thanos made, is he focused on quantity. He didn't think about the value of things, okay? We think in prices, we really think in value, the value of things. So when we think about prices, we also rec recognize that we buy things with money, but we really pay for them with our time. Now money, uh, we express that in dollars and cents, but we also have a time price and a time price we can express it in hours and minutes. The time price is simply, how much time does it take me to earn the money to buy something? So we can calculate a time price by just looking at the money price, how much does it cost, and divide that by your hourly income. And that will convert dollars and cents into hours and minutes. Now, the reason that we like time prices over money prices, there's four reasons. <clears throat> the first reason is that when an innovation happens, it does lots of things. The two things that it does is it lowers the price, but it also increases people's incomes, right? If there was an innovation that occurred in your company that you work at and everybody got a raise, everybody's income goes up. When you went to the store, everything would be cheaper because your income is higher. So time prices, since they're considering both, both the, the money price and the hourly income, they better do a better job of capturing what's happened in terms of innovation, okay? So first reason we like time prices, they better capture what's really happening. The second feature of time prices is that Economists generally, they talk about money prices and they divide them into two categories, the nominal price or the current price and some constant or real price. And they're always trying to make these adjustments for inflation because governments can, can create more and more uh, currency. We, we recognize that as inflation. If we go to a time price, we can ignore all of these uh, adjustment factors that are subjective and there's contention about them. So we, we can go completely around these, these uh, adjustment factors. We can ignore all those and go right to the time price. Now we can apply a time price anywhere at any time. We can go to France and look at, uh, go back in their newspapers and find the price of bread or eggs in 1850. And then in their currency, what was it? The French lira back then? Is that the French currency? Frank. Yeah, the franc, yeah, the franc. And we can look at what people were earning back in 1850. And we can take those two, two numbers and calculate, well, it costs someone uh, you know, 55 minutes to buy a dozen eggs. And we can then compare that today. So the other great feature of time prices is they're independent of currency and they're independent of what time you want to look at. Now, the fourth benefit is we're converting things to time. And time is a universal constant. Everybody gets the same 24 hours a day. We recognize this. Governments can't uh, uh, counterfeit time. They can't inflate time. You remember the movie uh, Iron Man, when Tony Stark is talking to his father and his father says, no amount of money ever bought a second of time. What he was saying is that uh, he was recognizing and telling Tony, look, governments may be able to create money, but they can't create time. Time is this universal constant, okay? All right, so what is money? A 4D printer, maybe one day. Yeah, something like that. If we can print time <laughs> with a 4D. Yeah, if we could print time, that would be fantastic, but we haven't been able to figure that one out yet. So what is money? Money is time. Okay. Now let's think about how we apply this uh, money is time concept. Let's go back to 1910. Sears Roebuck, that was a company, that was the Walmart of its day, 1910. They had this catalog. They didn't have the internet, but they had these big catalogs that they would mail to people. You get this catalog out, you could find all kinds of stuff in this catalog, and you could send off a check in an envelope, and a couple of weeks later, this package would show up from Sears. 
Um, <clears throat> Look in the catalog 1910, you'll find a bicycle. It's $11.95. That seems like a pretty good price until you consider what people were earning. In 1910, the average blue collar worker, blue collar workers have uh, uh, some skills uh, that they can perform. Blue collar worker was making about 18 cents an hour. So if I'm earning 18 cents an hour, how long does it take me to earn $11.95? It took me about 66 hours. So I'd spent a week and a half working and saving my money so I could buy my bicycle. So let's compare that uh, to today. Uh, 2021, I go to Walmart and I found a bike over there and it's only $99. Remember, the price has gone up, but what do we need to do to calculate the time price? What's hourly income? Now today, a blue collar worker earns about $32.54. Remember, their hourly compensation is $32.54, and that includes their wages and also benefits. So how long does it take to earn the money to buy a bike today? Well, at $32.54, it takes me about three hours. So I went from 66 hours down to three hours. So for the time it took me to work to earn one bicycle in 1910, if I take 66 hours and I did that same amount of work today, I would be able to earn the money to buy 22 bikes, right? So price of one is equal to the price of 22 today. So we have this tremendous abundance of bicycles that, that has occurred over this time. All right, are we, are we, uh, are we okay with this? Okay. So the other thing that we think about is the amount of free time this innovation has provided for us. Remember, we went from 66 hours down to three hours. So that really, that time price has fallen by 95%, 95.4%. What it also gives us is now we have 63 hours of free time that we can go do something else. We can earn money to buy something else. We can go to a movie. We can take a nap. We can read a book. We have this time now that is freed up to be able to do other things, okay? Now, uh, time prices were really advanced by an economist named William Nordhaus. He, he actually received the Nobel Prize in 2018. But what he did is he actually looked at the time price of light. Now, light is measured in something that we call a lumen. Now, one little birthday candle puts off about one lumen of light. Now, if you look at a standard light bulb today, that light bulb puts off about a thousand lumens of light. Now, if you turn your light bulb on and you use it for an hour, that's what we call one hour or 1000 lumen hours. So what uh, Professor Nordhaus did is he went and he looked at what it costs for people to earn the money to buy this thousand lumen hours, equivalent to turning the light bulb on for an hour today. So he goes back uh, and he, he begins with fire and he calculated how much time it took someone to do the work, to be able to have a fire that would give off this level of light for an hour. Then he looked at uh, oil lamps in Babylonia and uh, the time it took to uh, earn the money to buy the oil and have this level of light. And then he looked at the price of candles that were about 18, 1800 or so with, with the price of candles, the light, the time it took to, uh, to have one hour of candle light. And then of course we had this shift in, in technology that moved from using flame to using electricity. Edison's innovation was this great innovation. 1880s, he innovates light bulbs. And these light bulbs also are undergoing this innovation. And you might have seen this little curly, curly light bulb. It's a compact, compact fluorescent light. Um, and then, you, then we actually updated it to look at these LED lights that we see today. Here's what he found. To produce one hour of light uh, with an open flame took about 58 hours. To, uh, to have one hour of light with an oil lamp, you had to work 41 hours. 1800 is kind of an interesting date that we look at. We think that's when the industrial revolution started. So that, that time it took to get one hour of light in 1800, you spent 5.37 hours working to earn the money to buy the candles 
they have one hour of light at night. So not a lot of people <laughs> could afford light at night, still pretty expensive. Look at that difference though, when Edison comes along with his innovation, drops to 45 minutes, and then it drops to 49 seconds. The CF lights, about 0.4, less than a half a second you work to earn the money to have one hour of light. Today with the most advanced LED uh, lights, it takes you 0.16 seconds to earn the money to have one hour of light. So we go from, from 1800, 5.37 hours to <clears throat> 0.16 seconds. That means the time it took uh, your great, great grandfather to earn one hour of light, you actually can get 120,000, 825 hours of light today. So we've had this massive, increase in the abundance of light. It's, it's over 12 million percent increase in light. So lights are interesting. You know, iPhones are interesting. We typically think of innovation affecting all of these kind of things that are changing over time. So the question we ask is what about these basic kind of things like food, uh, materials, what's happened to those things? So part of what uh, we studied is we looked at 50 basic commodities, energy, uh, food, materials, metals, and uh, <clears throat> minerals. So we looked at crude oil and natural gas. We looked at coffee, tea, peanuts, bananas, corn, uh, chicken, uh, shrimp, logs, lumber, cotton, uh, aluminum, iron ore, uh, gold, and silver and platinum. So what do you think we found? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we went back to 1980. That's kind of where uh, we start getting really good data on these prices, these 50 uh, commodities. And uh, we, we uh, analyzed these 50 commodities. Uh, what do you think we found? Well, uh, we were really surprised. We were actually quite astonished. Those 50 commodities, basic commodities, if we go back to 1980, <clears throat> and then we look at them today, not a single one of them has become more expensive all of them have declined in price. In fact, the, uh, the average time price has actually fallen by 75%. Now this occurred at the same time the global population increased by 75%. So it's, it's kind of a interesting thing we notice that every time you increase population by a percent, these time prices fall by a percent. It's almost like the population is bringing some kind of innovation with them that's benefiting the rest of us. Now, remember when a time price falls, it really means that our abundance is increasing. Uh, so if a, time, if, a, if a price falls by 75%, it means that yesterday I could buy one, today I can get four for that same price. So my abundance is actually increased from one to four. That's a 300% increase in abundance. So if we plotted abundance here, and that's really what we think about, our abundance has increased by 300%. What used to take me, uh, the time it took me to buy one in 1980, if I devoted that same amount of time today, I would get, I would get four. So we've had this tremendous increase in abundance of just these basic commodities. All right, you ready for your final, your final exam? Okay, first question, what is wealth? What is wealth, George? Knowledge. Wealth is knowledge, okay. What is growth? Growth is learning. Growth is learning. And what is money? Money is time. Money is time. When okay. you run out of money, you're really running out of the time to, to earn additional money. Yeah. It's the time that is what remains scarce when everything else grows abundant. What are time prices? Time prices are simply the time it takes you to earn the money to buy something, right? That's the true price. Yeah, we call it the true price. In economics, you'll hear the nominal price, and then they'll, they'll, they refer to the real price. We economists refer to the real price. It's this price that's adjusted for inflation. Time prices, we call them the true price because they really go back to this true universal measure of time. 
And then question five, how do we measure the growth in knowledge? We measure the growth in knowledge by looking at the time price. If the time price is going down, it's a reflection of the increase in knowledge. Okay. All right. George got 100% on the final exam. <laughs> oh, good. Now, but what about equality? Everybody talks about equality. You know, you, that, what does this mean, these time prices? I, I, Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and Gates, they got all uh, money and time, don't they? I mean, what, what does time prices, how does time prices affect the estimate of equality? Okay. Uh, the, the, the fairness of this capitalist distribution that you're describing. That's, that's, the time is distributed 24 hours a day to everybody. So we have this equality of time to begin with, right? Yeah. Everybody gets the same 24 hours in every day. So I think what we, we, would, we would invite you to do is think about, instead of measuring equality in time, measure it or instead of measuring in the differences in, in money that people have measured in the differences in time that people have but let me give you an example to kind of illustrate this um okay let's go back to 1960 and look at the price of rice and the price of wheat indians use rice americans use wheat we like bread indians like uh like rice now <clears throat> The time it took for a typical Indian to earn the money to buy their daily uh, supply of rice for their family, it was <clears throat> in 1960, it took about seven hours, okay? Seven hours. I spent seven hours a day earning the money to buy my food for the day. Now, the time price of rice from 1960 do you think it's gone up or gone down? It's actually fallen by almost 90%, almost 90%. So today in India, it takes a person about 58 minutes, mm. less than an hour. It used to take them seven hours, and now it takes them less than an hour. Now in the United States, 1960, that also uh, tells us that an Indian today has about a little over six hours of time that they can devote to something else. Now, in the United States, 1960, it took about one hour to earn the money to buy the, the food uh, from the, based on the, the price of wheat. That price of wheat has fallen by 90%, almost 90% as well. So rice and wheat have both declined. Actually, wheat has fallen a little bit faster. So in the United States, it takes about seven and a half minutes to uh, earn that money. But think about what uh, the difference is in the time. In uh, India, Indians now have six hours of time. Americans get 52 minutes of time. So who's actually better off? Who is getting more free time over time? Because now you look at that that time, it looks like they're both, it's the ratio between the time it takes an Indian to earn their food and the time it takes an American to earn their food, that ratio hasn't changed. What's ha what has changed though, is this, uh, is this time. India, 1960, they spent about seven hours. 1960 in the US, it was about an hour, but, 2018, Indians are now spending less than an hour. Americans are spending about seven and a half minutes. So what I want you to think about is this difference here. Look at what the Indians were able to pick up. Look what the Americans were able to pick up, okay? So this innovation is really lifting, especially on these basic commodities, it's lifting the uh, least advantaged people on the planet much faster. They're the people that are benefiting from this innovation in these basic commodities. So it's something that we, we, we've got to be really, really happy about that this innovation now is, is able to lift. There is a good question popped up here. Um, the, one of uh, the, or 
Yeah, Gail, do y'all want to, do you want to take questions now? It's totally up to you. I don't know, there was, a, it was a relevant question okay. about uh, how much time it takes to earn the money to acquire the skills, okay. the knowledge to acquire the learning. Right. To, uh, <laughs> so this, a lot of times people will talk about, you should, uh, you know, where should you invest? Where should you invest? And people say, well, you should invest in the stock market. Right, and the stock market historically has generated what about five to seven percent return up and down historically. Uh, you compare that to investing instead of your your time investing your time to earn the money to invest in the stock market. If you invest your time to learn and then use that learning, now that investment, what does it yield for you? Mm -hmm. And when you look at blue collar wages, for example, these wages are typically increasing much faster than the price of things, which suggests that these investments in knowledge yield a much higher rate of return for someone than, uh, than these, other, these other investments. Uh, people talk about real estate and the stock market. It's like, you know, the investment in knowledge and learning tends to yield much, much higher returns, not only for a society, but for you individually, you individually. Okay. Let me uh, let me just conclude here. Well, interesting quote, very interesting quote from Jordan Peterson. You might know him. He said, "You get a much different answer if you compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today." So our perspective, in instead of looking this direction, if we look this direction, instead of uh, looking horizontally, comparing ourselves to other people, if we look vertically and look. Uh, look back at time at our parents, our grandparents, and compare ourselves to their condition, we see a much different answer about our, our relative prosperity and what our, what our lives have done. So <clears throat> I, I, I want to just conclude here real, uh, real quick with a couple of things, then, and then I want you to be able to talk to George. Now, we've gone uh, from this world of candles to fiber optic uh, light cables, this ability to to have this abundance of light. We've gone from uh, abacuses and slide rules to, to uh, cell phones. And we've gone from the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk to Elon Musk and the, the heavy the Falcon. And this has all happened in the last 100 to 200 years. There are voices out there that, that uh, talk about doom and gloom. And there's lots of those voices. Thanos is one of those voices. There's other people today that talk about this. What I would tell you is that, that while there are periods of doom, there are greater periods of boom, that our ability to innovate after we face a crisis, a catastrophe, uh, suggests that human beings have this ability to come out of these uh, periods of catastrophe or gloom in a much better condition. We go from doom and gloom to boom and zoom. Zoom, what we're doing right now is really a consequence of this kind of COVID catastrophe. So, so I would just leave you with this, with this thought. <clears throat> this world is full <clears throat> and it's filled with abundance. And if we are free, if we allow others to be free, to, to think, to innovate, to experiment and try their ideas, and then the freedom to go to a market to see if they've created something of value, that that process will lift all of us. So I hope that this gives you a, a sense of, of what George Gilder has established and laid down as a foundation for how to think about how the world works. And if you begin to think about these principles, it will change the way that you think about the world. And I, I believe that uh, your ability to understand the world and create value for one another um, will be greatly enhanced. Thank you very much. All right. So let's just, we have a few more minutes to take questions uh, before we do, we're supposed to end at 50 after the hour. Uh, there's one really good one here for e either of you, but somebody asked, how does gold and silver measure up to the price of acquisition over time? Has this remained fairly constant or is it also fluctuated like buying a bike or creating an hour of light? It's a great question. Gail, you want to tackle that? 
You know, I'm going to let George do that because he <laughs> understands gold much better than I do and what gold has done. So what did he ask about gold or? Um, yeah, the time price of gold. Yeah. What it's done. That's uh, the time price to extract an incremental troy ounce of gold has hardly changed at all for a thousand years. It's a uh, very little change in uh, the time price to extract incremental gold. And that's because uh, uh, as you apply more capital, more technology, more mining equipment, more seismic uh, means of exploration, the gold that you are pursuing uh, becomes uh, more dilute, more remote, more difficult to extract. So while uh, a man with a pan and a stream could sieve out gold back in uh, nuggets, back in uh, the gold rush in California. It, uh, it takes 10 years to build a vast new gold mine. To, and, uh, and so the time it takes to uh, extract an incremental ounce of gold has scarcely changed. The gold mine will then generate a lot more gold, but it's taken 10 years to build right. it and, right. and, <laughs> thousand, and it's, it's just, the fact is that gold effectively cancels time and it cancels technology and capital and, and progress and leaves you with a very pure measure of uh, time. And that's, uh, that's why gold is money. It's because it's uh, it's really time. It's really time. Gold is a great proxy for time. And when when uh, our currency system was a gold standard, it was based on converting currency to gold at a fixed rate, and that allowed this stability to occur because uh, we had this really proxy for uh, for time with gold. And George has a great story about Isaac Newton and the gold standard and how. Uh, we think of Isaac Newton as yeah. being this great uh, thinker and physicist, but he really created this gold standard for uh, the British Empire that, that allowed us to have two. He was master of the men during the critical early years of the gold standard, and I think he was the pivotal figure in the British Empire and, and the Industrial Revolution. He provided both the physics and the money. Yeah. And, uh, the, and that uh, allowed for a global sway of, uh, of uh, time prices around the world. That was- You've got to read George's, uh, read yeah. George's uh, stuff on Isaac Newton. You'll, you'll really, be, uh, uh, really be surprised at what he did for us. Yeah. Well, he, he okay, really one more wanted, question. He wanted to prove that, that you couldn't uh, convert lead or some other set of elements into gold cheaply. And, and uh, that was what his alchemy was about. It was proving that gold was a kind of ultimate element that couldn't be reproduced by uh, chemical or alchemical means. Right. And uh, whereas today, uh, uh, from time to time, they're claimed a scientific uh, and Nature, one of the publications recently had a paper about how people are now beginning to learn how to produce gold from other elements, but it's a very- uh, Very expensive. Uh, very expensive. <laughs> very time consuming, <laughs> right? Time consuming. Very time consuming. <laughs>